welcome back to the Beer Ladies podcast. I am Christina and I am your host today. I'm joined by my lovely co-host Katie and we have with us an amazing guest. Um, But before I say who has joined us today, I just want to remind you to check us out on the socials and wherever you get your podcasts. And if you'd like to follow along, we're also on YouTube. So we are joined today by Jennifer Jordan, and if you don't know who she is, well, we can't wait to tell you, but before we get into that, it's the infamous, what are you drinking? So Katie, what are you drinking today? Well, I know Jennifer knows a lot about hops, so I got the Hop Buffet from Lervig, which uh, says it has 40 hop varietals what <laughs> i know i know and then i was like what is a varietal and is it the same as a hop variety i don't know but sure there we go that's a lot of hops <laughs> <laughs> i went on the website they have that they're not on the can it will probably take up too much space <laughs> But there's a list. There is all kinds of hops from, you know, West Coast to German to all over I'm the world. So curious now. Totally. <laughs> um, that's what it looks like. It's hazy. Ooh. What's it taste like, though? I'm not I'm not a trained uh, <laughs> beer judger, so I'm not going to tell. I, I won't be able to tell you. I'll tell you if it's nice or not. Okay. That's that's all I want to know because I feel like it could be like a lot. <laughs> it it is a lot, but it's so yeah, there's a lot of different stuff, but it's quite it's it's very palatable. So it yeah. works. It works, like yeah. It's a double really IPA. Curious. Double IPA 7.3%. Nice. There you go. Now, Jennifer, I know it's like, you know, the morning in Wisconsin. <laughs> so um, what do you have? <laughs> uh, I'm drinking um, Lake Michigan tap water out of a pint glass. So <laughs> thank you, Lake Michigan, okay. um, for your service. <laughs> um, I'm also drinking a giant bottle of water. And I'm not drinking, but I did bring this today, which is Lervig and I, Katie and I did not plan this, I promise. No. Um, this is their alcohol free, no worries IPA. Um, which yeah, I'm interested in exploring more alcohol free options. So this looked really cool. Um, yeah, so excited for that one. Add to my stash. <laughs> so now we can get into the interview today. So I want to start off with just um Jennifer, if you could just introduce yourself and and sort of brief overview of, of what you do. Sure. Um, I am a professor of sociology and urban studies at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and uh, happily former department chair, uh, which means that I now have more time for writing this book about hops. Uh, I have written a lot about memory, about landscapes. Um, my last book was called Edible Memory, about heirloom tomatoes and antique apples, and my first book was about Berlin and memory in the urban landscape. Uh, and now I'm writing something that might seem like quite a departure, uh, but the sort of underlying themes are really similar. And this is a book uh, about 19th century hop farming in Wisconsin. And I'll note that book started out as um, approximately a thousand years of hop history across multiple countries. <laughs> and as I began the research process and realized kind of the riches available to me here in Wisconsin, it got narrower and narrower and narrower. Um, and yeah, so now that's the focus on 19th century Wisconsin hops. Amazing. So I want to start out with just like some more general questions before we tackle like the book and some of your specific Wisconsin research. And I definitely want to touch back on the, the, the heirloom tomatoes, but um, how did, how did beer history come about? How did this hop history come about? Um, what drew you to this and to, to, to beer as a, as a topic? Um, I, it was when I finished the edible memory book. And a lot of that story is about how do you take 
a consumable like a tomato and kind of change its meaning, right? And and thus also its use and its materiality and physicality. So, uh, you know, tomato, the concept of an heirloom tomato is relatively new. And so I was interested in how that came to be and how um, people developing a, a taste for something can then alter that object. So actually the taste for heirloom tomatoes is, it turns out to be good for tomato biodiversity. Uh, whereas like the taste for bluefin tuna is bad for tuna biodiversity. Um, so cul in cultivated foods, a taste for a wide array of um, kind of genetic backgrounds is actually good for that biodiversity. Um, so I was interested in consumer tastes changing landscapes and affecting plants. Uh, and beer seems like, uh, once I finished that book, beer seemed like another place where kind of culture matters a lot um, and where the meaning of beer changes a lot over time, right? In some places it's a working class beverage and other places it's a high status beverage, you know, different times and places. Um, certain beers have kind of careers, you know, where they kind of become significant or more in demand or they fade away. And that as a sociologist, I'm really interested in all of the kind of cultural work that goes into something that's also economic, that also has a landscape. Um, so I started thinking about just changing meanings of beer. And as I did that, I realized a lot of people had done that already. There's a lot of good work on that, um, a lot of sociologists thinking about it. So it was a kind of natural progression, my interest in uh, consumption and consumers and, and consumption and the effect of consumption on the world. And so I started to kind of drill down a little bit like into hops uh, because part of what fascinates me is we don't need hops to survive, right? It's not, hops are not wheat um, or, you know, other kind of crops that people actually live off of. Hops are really only there for pleasure um, and they're kind of inconsequential for human survival. That feels blasphemous to say as someone who, <laughs> you know, is writing a book about hops, but um, that's part of what's so interesting that the pursuit of that bitterness of the aromas of, you know, or in earlier days of the kind of preservative qualities that the pursuit of something so inessential for human survival still has really big consequences for landscapes, for what I also call laborscapes, you know, the, the labor force necessary to produce these hops. Um, and so that seemed significant to me. And the, the really like big moment in rethinking my hop work um, and le leaving the 21st century was uh, reading Unger's book on um, beer and brewing in the Middle Ages and Renaissance. And there's a passage in there where he talks about hops growing close to the Baltic Sea. And I was like, what? I have never heard of hops growing in Germany outside of Bavaria and, you know, sort of regions to the south. And that's partly just my own ignorance, but this was new to me, new information that hops used to grow in other places, um, like, you know, close to the Baltic. So that got me wondering how many other places have failed hop industries, right? How many other places were hops once really significant parts of the agricultural economy, significant parts of the landscape, and then that faded away. Um, and so there you see like, again, my interest, my work on memory is often really about forgetting also. So the tension between memory and forgetting. So, you know, much of certain parts of Europe, uh, UK, United States are covered in forgotten agricultural landscapes, including hops. So that's now what I'm doing is uncovering those landscapes. So interesting. <laughs> and I, I was going to ask you, how does your, you know, how does sociology come in? You know, how, how do you sort of marry that with the history, um, which you, you sort of mentioned, but I wonder if you could just expand a little bit about that, because I think that's so fascinating, this idea of memory and forgetting and, and, and yeah. Uh, I do it in, in a few ways. So I am, I'm a historical, qualitative, cultural sociologist. And so, you know, one of my skills is being able to just kind of pull information out of somewhat obscure archives and turn that into a better understanding of, of human action. 
Um, but I'm also doing some really conventional sociological work um, because it turns out that the agricultural census um, from the 19th century lists every single hop farmer. Um, so everyone who was growing even one pound of hops. Um, and in fact, the census taker in one case recorded someone growing a half a pound of hops. So there are these huge books, like huge tomes over in the Wisconsin Historical Society, which is about an hour and a half west of me. Um, and you can, I can just flip, they're not digitized. So other states in the US have their ag census, agricultural census digitized, Wisconsin's is not. So I sit there with these huge books and I transcribe the hop farmers into an Excel database. Um, so I have now about 3000 hop farmers and I think I'm gonna end up with close to five because I decided to count every single hop farmer in Wisconsin in 1850, 1860, 1870. And this is probably gonna be two paragraphs in my book, but it is gonna allow me to very definitively say who was growing hops. And um, that's important because there's a lot of, everyone thinks the Germans you know, were behind the hops in Wisconsin. They were not, um, that they were, pretty irrelevant um, as farmers. Uh, and I can say that like 1850, I believe there were two Germans growing hops. Um, 1860, there are more. 1870, there are even more. Um, but they're absolutely not the leading edge of, of hop farmers. So again, the sort of sociological side, I can actually count, you know, who's there, where are they from? Um, and then the other thing that the census data lets me do through a very time consuming process is find all their wives um, because that's the other big story here that I was not thinking about at all when I started this project, um, which I feel really like I'm annoyed at myself that it hadn't occurred to me, but it turns out none of the hops in the 19th century in Wisconsin um, and also probably in New York State and other places, they were, it was not possible to have that industry without women's labor. And just all over everywhere. <laughs> like, so all of those hops flowing into 19th century US breweries were possible because of women picking hops and because of women hosting the young women who came to pick hops. The story out, out West is a little bit different, but in Wisconsin, New York, probably Vermont, um, you know, these other more Eastern hop industries, young white women were the main hop pickers and they were hosted by the wives essentially of these hop farmers. That's fascinating. I find that really, really fascinating. That wouldn't have occurred to me at all. Right? I mean, I, yeah. it hadn't occurred to me either, um, embar somewhat embarrassingly, but it's like, oh, wait a minute. Like every single, so every blossom is picked by hand, right? There's no mechanized yeah. harvesting until the 20th century and, or, you know, almost not, not on any wide mm -hmm. scale. Um, and, and so all of those hands, right? Out in the fields, it's, it's also really, really, constrained by time, you know, that these hops ripen in, in Wisconsin, it's August or early September, and they have to be picked, right, very quickly, get into the dryers very quickly. And so these farmers are really dependent on this labor force um, to get all those hops picked. And, um, you know, one of the treasures that I have from the Wisconsin Historical Society is the diary of the daughter of a hop farmer who she picked hops herself and then also hosted the pickers. Um, and so it's hard to get details on who they were, but at one point, at least there were about a dozen young women coming to pick hops. And so the family would have to build beds for them, like stuff straw ticks for them to sleep on, do all of this like baking and ironing and washing and everything that Ella, the diarist describes in great detail to prepare for them. Um, and that, you know, it's an enormous amount of work to feed all of these people. And then um, also to be picking hops themselves um, too at the same time. So it all sounds very exhausting. And she definitely expresses relief when the hop pickers uh, finally leave and they can, she says, we can breathe easier now, you know, that they're gone. Wow, yeah. 
I mean, that would be fascinating to find out what type of woman was a hop picker, you know, and it, it, you, you're saying that she didn't allude to it in her in her diary um, quite so much. But that would be fascinating, wouldn't it? To know, was this, is it the same women over and over again or is it a rite of passage or? Yeah, so interesting. She does mention the same pickers coming back um, in, in a second year. And um, in, a, in a different document, but related to that family, uh, there is a description of the hot pickers coming from counties to the north um, with sandier soil where hops weren't grown. So there wasn't a hop harvest up there. And so those women would then come south um, to the part of, Wisconsin has kind of this weird diagonal uh, tension zone going across it where there's a different um, kind of, I don't know, atmospheric conditions, geological conditions, and different things grow to the southwest versus to the northeast. And so the women were coming from the non-hop regions, at least for this family. Um, in the boom, so that, that's the other thing about this hop industry, is it starts slow, um, there, you know, seems to start actually 1837, which is very early. Um, and in, in Waukesha County um, on um, Potawatomi land um, that you know this, these English settlers have just arrived on and plant hops on. Um, and then it slowly grows and in the Civil War era, so 1860s, then there's a boom, then it, it just goes nuts. And there's huge quantities of, you know, every year there's more hops being grown people get rich. Um, and then there's one year where New York state, which had been the big hop supplier, basically goes offline. Um, they have a blight and the price of Wisconsin hops skyrockets. And so everyone's like, oh my God, like let's plant more hops, more, 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 more. And, you know, shockingly, then it crashes. <laughs> um, the next year, New York comes back online. The brewers, you know, people still prefer New York hops um, versus what they call Wisconsin's. No one's using variety names at all, um, or or very rarely. It's you know Wisconsin's versus East Coast hops or York hops or New York hops, um, and and so then Wisconsin has overplanted, overproduced. All these hops are ripening, you know, it's sort of the things are coming to fruition that started a year and a half or two years before. And you could just feel everyone be like, no, 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 like, please stop ripening. Um, and, and the bottom falls out of the market. And so there are these descriptions of hop pickers not getting paid, of hops piling up um, at the train depot, piling up at a warehouse in New York, in lower Manhattan, like Wisconsin hops, you know sort of being stashed in this warehouse. And, um, and then some farmers trying to decide, do they hold their hops and then sell them as yearlings the next year in the hopes that maybe, you know, the price will come back up a little bit. Um, so it's quite dramatic. Um, and so in that boom, um, you need an enormous labor force right, in order for that boom to work. So there are, I I'm, I'm feel like some of this is still apocryphal, but there are references to like 30,000 young women flooding into this part of Wisconsin. Um, I, I feel like I want to get a little more detail on that <laughs> before I comfortably cite that number. Um, but yeah, it just just gigantic quantities of hops needing picking and very quickly. Wow. That's, that's so, I can't, that's so many, you know, so many women coming. Yeah. That's huge. Yeah. Huge. <laughs> it's, it's huge. And it's the logistics, you know, they all come into this little train station in Kilbourne city, which is today the Wisconsin Dells. And then they get picked up in wagons, you know, and then taken out to, um, to all of these farms and just the quantity of food you had to provide <laughs> it's, it's mostly seems to be young people you know so unmarried um women you know late teens early 20s um and you're giving them you know three meals a day or whatever just like constant cooking and there are other accounts of 
hop farmers' wives, like borrowing dishes and, you know, other kitchen implements and things from neighbors in order to just have enough to, um, to do all of this work. Um, and then there's also talk of kind of for some people, the hop harvest being like a fun social time and for other people and kind of probably especially the wives of the farmers just such an enormous quantity of like physical labor um that it is not actually very fun <laughs> not particularly enjoyable I'm just listening to this and I'm sure you know yourself hearing so many parallels between this and the hop harvest in like Kent oh, yeah. um in the UK and I'm I'm wondering because it was similar like they had like trains full of people coming yep. from like from the cities um and the one thing that I was struck particularly in the 19th century in the UK was that a lot of the conditions for the hot pickers were really poor yeah um it sounds like things were a little bit different in Wisconsin uh yes and so and that's also where there's a contrast to the west coast um too so I think there's really you know one of the big divides is are the pickers sleeping under the roof of the farmer, um, you know, whether it's the barn or the house, but are they kind of hosted or are they, you know, self-catering? Are they camping um, essentially? Mm -hmm. And so, and then that also often is coming as families, you know, not necessarily coming as, I think part of the, the young women was, you know, their virtue being protected by being under the roof of the farmer's wife, you know, like being up in the attic in, in a whole bunch of bunks or something. And, and in a lot of Kent and certainly in California, a lot of hot picking was done more by multi-generational groups, you know, at least in some places or by brigades of men, you know, in California, it was at different times in the 19th century and in different places, it could be Chinese men, Japanese men, Filipino men, uh, Native American families, some Anglo families, but in a lot of those cases, not all, but on a lot, it was, you know, people camping near the hop farm. And so was kind of responsible for their own uh, provisioning. Uh, there might be like a, a store nearby or, you know, sort of something set up to get them supplies, but they were more responsible for their own conditions and sometimes those conditions were good and sometimes they were really bad and there's you know the Wheatland hop riot in California in the 20th century and definitely in in Kent um you know there are times when hop pickers die of cholera there's the mm -hmm. sort of catastrophic um cult, like a wagon driving off of a bridge and a flood you know there are sort of real dangers to um people's well-being and then all those kind of sometimes patronizing concerns about um, you know, the conditions, you know, were people having too much fun or what kind of fun? Um, so. So interesting. I'm really interested in this contrast between Wisconsin and California. Could you sort of expand a little bit about what you found sort of, are there a lot of differences or, or, or not really? Uh, there are. And, and I think, you know, some of that is about uh, scale and some of it is about immigration and you know who's available to be the labor force at, at what time. Um, so in you know in Wisconsin in the 1850s, 1860s, 1870s, most of the people coming into the state were Yankee or European. Um, and in California that was that was quite different, you know. Um, and there, there was a much more diverse labor force, in part because of people who had been brought in from China to work on the railroad. Um, and then, then you, you know, after that, you get the Chinese Exclusion Act and other um, policies that sort of change the patterns of, of immigration. Um, but you just have a, a different labor pool. The other thing that in California that's different is the scale of the farms. Um, so in some places, so in Sonoma County, um, where Russian River is um, along the Russian River, that is now wine country, it was hop country. Um, so all of those old alluvial plains, the oxbows of the Russian River created the soil that hops like. And so what's now vineyards would have been hop fields at different points, um, but those are small. And so those would have had a labor force more like Wisconsin um, where 
smaller scale, uh, I mean, it's still big in the big picture, but an individual farm wouldn't have so many hop pickers, uh, might host them. It could also be relatives um, doing some of that picking. In Sacramento, um, so the, the um, around the Sacramento River, and um, and then other, there's another river that I'm blanking on its name, but here, these are much bigger valleys, much bigger rivers, and so much, much, much bigger hop farms, huge scale of hop farms because you have a whole lot of flat land to, to plant hops in. And that then requires a totally different kind of labor force, right? There's no way to house that labor force in your barn. Um, and so then you get people camping like along the nearby river. Um. And who was setting up these farms? Was it, did, did these people have any experience in growing hops? Like in Wisconsin, yeah. did they just, as they saw, oh, people are making money off this, so I'm going to try my hand at it. Or, or were they, did they know anything about nurturing hops or what they needed to do or? That's a fantastic question. And I, I think the story of agriculture, certainly in the U.S., is that there's like a lot of terrible farmers um, at, at different points in time. There are a lot of gifted farmers, but then there are also people who they're, they just want to try to make money off of this land and but actually have very little training in growing things in that particular place. So with hops in Wisconsin, it seems to be a mixture of very experienced hop growers. Um, so some of the key figures in the in the arrival of hops in Wisconsin are from England or from New York State and had hop growing experience, um, not necessarily as property owners, but tending the hop fields of other property owners. Um, and so they actually knew the plant very well. And that's really a lot of the story of Wisconsin hops is New York State's influence. So both farmers and hop roots flow into Wisconsin from New York State. On the other hand, you know, by the time you're in that boom era in the 1860s, everyone is planting hops, um, right? Mm -hmm. Terrible farmers, like people are borrowing a bunch of money to just stuff a bunch of hops in the ground and like hope they get rich and, um, and people absolutely lose their shirts, you know, then when it, when it crashes, the, the industry does continue. So it isn't over um, in 1867, 1868. Um, it, it absolutely continues. My theory, and this one, this I don't have, like, I haven't found the detailed evidence for it, but my hunch is that it continues in farms where the farmer was already very diversified um, and where, you know, the hot price falling didn't affect the other crops um, that the farmer had. And so they could, they didn't lose their farm because of the hop crash. Um, and so some of those folks then keep growing hops, certainly into the 1870s, 1880s, um, there is still a hop industry um, here. But I think those are probably with people with a little more skill with regard to hop cultivation. Well, it sounds like the cryptocurrency of its day, kind of in a way, <laughs> doesn't it? <laughs> everybody's like, let, everybody's making money. Let's do it. Oh yeah, yeah, totally, totally. It's really cool. Um, do you want to? So the woman's diary that you were talking about is is Ella Seymour, um, right? Yes. Did yes. I? Yes. Um, could you speak a little bit more about her and about women in hot picking? Uh, sure, sure. Um, she, you know, it's it's rare to have a diary like that. Um, it's just, it's written in a little ledger. Um, her father was like an obsessive ledger keeper um, and day books and, you know, account books. Um, and so she clearly just sort of acqu acquired like not a fancy diary, but just a ledger that was around. And I don't know if he gave it to her, or, you know, she just found it and, um, <laughs> But it's it's very little. She started keeping it when she was 21, um, like on her 21st birthday. And um, sort of details, lots of chores, lots of illnesses, um, lots of fruit. So for some whatever reason, like this family loved fruit. And there is just a lot of discussions of fruit in um, this diary, which is kind of fascinating. Um, and then this kind of rhythm of you know, then in August, they start getting ready for the hot pickers, and then there's the harvest, and then 
And, and that you really feel in reading a diary, like the way, you know, the seasons matter um, and how their lives really change, you know, especially in a place like this, again, versus parts of California where the seasons are a little more subtle. You know, I, I say this as someone who grew up in California, like I, they're still, you know, this winter was not subtle <laughs> out there, but um, it's still, it's different from Wisconsin where it's so stark, you know, it's like you, there's a season when, when you garden and a season when everything's dead. Um, and which is right now. So you get that sense of the rhythm of, of hot picking and then also life in general um, from her diary. And um, she also had uh, kyphosis. She had a, a very um, sort of starkly curved spine um, from the time that she was a small baby. Um, and uh, that, you know, she writes about it a little bit um, in her, in not so much in her diary, but in another letter that she wrote um, after her sister died, um, who was kind of her best friend. Uh, so it's, you know, this is the strange thing as a sociologist, uh, you know, part of my training is about writing about big patterns, you know, writing about um, groups of people and analyzing them rather than focusing on the individual. And so that's one of the challenges in this book is sort of how do I balance telling that big story that I get from the census data and, you know, the sort of bigger sweep of history uh, with these, this information I have about individuals' lives, right? You know, so Ella is unique, you know, in, in, idiosyncratic, unusual in so many ways, and yet she is one of my few windows into kind of what the work was like um, mm -hmm. on the ground of hot picking. And that that's part of what fascinates me is that, you know, all of these entries in the census, right? It's so dry. It's so, in the agricultural census, they don't mention wives or any, you know, it's just the farmer. And I do, I have about 20 women listed as hop farmers um, in the census too. So that's a whole other, um, you know, chapter to, to get into. But um, all of that work, translates into right an individual's life into mm -hmm. an individual's work on the land um, into individuals transforming the space they live in which in Ella's case was also that was ho-chunk land um, and they had ho-chunk neighbors you know and and the era of of hop growing in Wisconsin was also the era in which the federal government was repeatedly and violently trying to remove ho-chunk people from land that was being farmed, you know, increasingly for wheat and uh, corn, oats, barley, you know, in land that had been oak savanna, oak openings, uh, prairie, and had been, you know, the home of, in this, in most of hop country, it was Ho-Chunk people, in other parts of, of hop country, some Potawatomi, um, some Ojibwe, and other, you know, Native American communities, and it wasn't that they were then gone, um, you know, people, particularly Ho-Chunk um, removal was, again, it, it resulted in a lot of death and a lot of loss, uh, and people also returned um, and continued to inhabit uh, the land in, in many different ways. And so that's, I think, also an important part of, of Ella's story is like, here's this individual's life, but she's living in the middle of this much bigger sweep of kind of geopolitical change um, that is affecting, you know, what we now understand as Wisconsin. That's crazy. So is, it, is Ella's diary published? No, it's just this no. little thing in, you know, that sits in a cardboard box over in the Wisconsin Historical Society. And I have, I have it transcribed. And so at some point I'm going to um, clean up the transcription and just give it to the Historical Society so that they can uh, post it. Um, and, you know, and then anyone can, can. Yeah, read that is, yeah, that's fascinating that, that, so there's so much history that exists in cardboard boxes or yeah. you know are on a shelf somewhere that hasn't seen the light of day in 30 40 years yeah and it's you know to it is at least well archived right so when i threw the word hops into the wisconsin historical society database this that box showed up um so that was good and then i also know from a book an unpublished book written by Ella's niece, who Ella never would have met, because also Ella died um, not too long after 
the time of this diary. She died in her, I think she was 27. Um, and, uh, but her brother took over the farm and then her brother's daughter wrote this book about that, you know, that farm and that life and everything. And um, so, oh shoot, I just totally forgot what, what my point was from that book um, that I know, oh, right. Uh, that I know um, Ella's brother Merton obsessively kept all of his father's, like all of their father's papers and um, their hop house turned into like that garage where you just stash all your old stuff. So they stopped growing hops. They didn't need the hop house, which was the, you know, the hop kiln or the oast house. Um, they didn't need it anymore. So that's where they stashed the spinning wheel or spinning wheels. So they had a flax spinning wheel and a wool spinning wheel, stash those in the hop house, stash the old wooden cradle from Connecticut in the hop house, like all the junk they didn't need. And again, Ella's brother then also kept all the papers. Um, and so he had, he held on to Ella's diary, his father's ledgers, his father's letters. Um, and it's only because he so meticulously, he was, you know, seemed to, be, shall we say a bit of a collector <laughs> um, and and so th those were things he kept among many other things um, and there's a scene in that that book that his daughter wrote of the family kind of trying to tidy up his mess um, and throwing a bunch of papers into the stove like the wood stove and he he was he came home from something and saw what they were doing and panicked that they had gotten rid of his most precious papers but he had actually stuffed them into a coat um, into like coat pockets when he attended a, you know, old settlers meeting recently. So all of those papers get saved um, because they're in the coat pockets uh, and the family didn't find them when they were doing their big clean out. And this is, it's actually a, a really common story of ledgers and letters, right? They're so, so full of information. They're also pretty good at being used as kindling, you know, or to, to start fires. And people also use them as, as insulation. Um, so there's a really great article about like 19th century account books in the US that talks about how many of these things ended up at, stuffed into rafters or uh, the spaces in, in walls as insulation or ended up in wood stoves. So it's just kind of an anomaly that we have this window into this moment and into this particular family um, because most of the families I'm writing about in the census, right? It's silence. Um, there's, there really isn't any of that information. It's so cool. Like, it's just, it's, it's so interesting to hear about this and, and just the small book and all the information you can get from that. And I just, well, I'm a, you know, I'm a historian, so I'm a little biased, but I just think that's so cool. <laughs> So, Katie, do you have any questions? I have loads of questions. But... <laughs> Where to start? <laughs> you mentioned that um, people like the New York hops more than the Wisconsin hops. But what about the California hops? Did they did they feature or were they new as well and not as popular as New York or? That so anecdotally, um, it feels like it, there was a slow process, and other people probably know more about that side of things than I do. Um, obviously, Stan Hieronymus is always a good person to talk to about kind of the careers of hops, and he's been really helpful um, for me too. Like I can definitely go to him with with questions that come up. But that story of like the changing reputations of different hop regions is really fascinating and someone should really write a book about it <laughs> and, and they should ask me for some of my materials because I it's more than I can can get to in this but you know that the naming of hops um first of all right it's so much about you know as as you probably know too but in the 19th century it's so much about region rather than variety um so it really seems like almost all of the hops being grown in Wisconsin in the 19th century were cluster um, and you do see the word cluster appear now and then, but they are also called in like newspapers and in, in beer um, publications, they're called Wisconsin's. Um, and then they're graded, you know, on, on quality, um, which is 
judged differently at that time than it would be today. So, but things change, right? So somehow California does become in more demand. And then California is shipping hops to, you know, Ireland, to England, like sort and globally, um, you can see these export records. So things definitely shift. And then obviously today, the Pacific Northwest is just totally ascendant um, and continues to be. My theory is that it won't always be because that seems to be how things go. Um, on the other hand, you know, the Hollow Tau and, and Kent and Pacific Northwest do continue to grow hops that, that are in demand. But that's... Um, you know, the, the way that that happens, there's something really interesting going on in there, right? And it's about brewers. Uh, so, and that's the part that I don't have any window into. It's like, what's their thought process? You know, are they really noticing a difference when they brew with Wisconsin's versus, you know, California's or New York's or whatever? Or um, is it just that they know in general, the hops coming from this place are picked better, you know, there's fewer stems and seeds, um, they're dried better, you know, is it more the kind of technical process? And that I just really don't know, um, kind of, you know, on a day-to-day -day brewer by brewer, like how that change happens. Yeah, and I read an article in, was it Good Beer Hunting? And uh, you were trying to cultivate some rhizomes. <laughs> yes. How, how is that going? I, well, I think it's going well. Um, I, so because I have like very good skills of using tax records and Google earth and old plat maps, um, I, and I know where a lot of the hop farmers lived. And so hops, as you know, are rhizomatic. So even when they stopped growing hops, often the rhizomes remained, or at least some of them, you know, they grub them up, but like there's going to be something left over. And so you'll still find hops today in Wisconsin growing on the edges of cornfields and soy fields and, you know, still finding their way um, to the sun. And so I figured out where Jesse Coddington's farm was, and he's the first person um, to bring hops, as far as I can tell to Sauk County, which was the heart of um, Wisconsin's hop industry. And so I found his farm and I uh, drove around <laughs> um, and it's really this little country roads, it's almost impossible to pull over. There's no you know, shoulder really. And, but, I, but there was this one spot, there was sort of a little cliff across the street from his old farm and I could actually get my car just off the road enough. And I pulled it over and started looking at this little sort of, you know, cliff face and there are vines all over it. And then finally did find hop leaves um, and then came back a little later and found the blossom, you know, the blossoms had started um, and then <laughs> um, reached into the ground and pulled out a, a hop root and I had shovel a little trowel with me and everything and I was like oh no I just need to use my hand so I ripped out this root and you know to be clear there's a ton of hops here it wasn't like I was ripping out the one remaining <laughs> hop. I, I took this, this chunk of rhizome and then um I tried once and failed with it because I think I was I didn't get the right kind of root chunk and then I tried again and it has grown in my yard. The thing is, it didn't have any blossoms last year. Um, and so we'll see if it actually does this year or if I somehow got the wrong, you know, wrong root uh, not making blossoms. So uh, we'll see. And obviously any hot plant, it takes a couple of years for it to really get rolling. Um, so it looked pretty um, and it's, it is growing in my yard here and Milwaukee. So I'm about two hours east of um, all that hop country. Cool. Amazing. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah. And there are, you know, there are quite a few people in, not quite a few, there are people in Wisconsin who have also already kind of tracked down those kinds of hops and then grown them enough to get enough hops to brew with um, and then brewed. And, and this also, there's a brewery in, um, in California that has done this as well of, you know, sort of using these old farmers hops um, in 
a few of their of their brews again because they're probably mostly cluster and cluster isn't especially in demand um, these days. It's there aren't a lot of beers you know using those kinds of historical hops. Would they be considered just historical hops, or what? What time zone makes them heirloom as opposed to historical? <laughs> Is there? Well, you know, I haven't really heard the phrase heirloom hop all that okay. much in the way that I have like with tomatoes and, and yeah. other things. Um, and, you know, that that's a really good question. And I don't really know. I don't know. <laughs> answer. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you have any sort of final questions, Katie? No, no, but I'm looking forward to your book when it comes out. Yeah, when, when it's finished. Yeah, no, pre no pressure. Right. So, what's the title, and when? What? 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 What are you anticipating? Because you know, I know myself. Like with that question. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, so I'm not. I don't like the current title. Um, it's a placeholder title. So if anyone has good title ideas, um, send them my way. The current uh, title, working title is Before Craft Beer, Lost Landscapes of Forgotten Hops. But that is quite a mouthful. Um, and so we'll see that I'm sure that will change. It is under contract already with the University of Chicago Press, uh, who I did my last book with. It might be a little overdue to them, so it's, which is fine. Um, and uh, being department chair uh, for the last three years slowed the writing process a little bit. Um, so this year I am trying to write a lot, a lot, a lot, and uh, really hoping to finish the manuscript this year. Um, and then it will take a little while, you know, the production mm -hmm. process always is a little bit slow. So I don't want to put a date. I can't put a date on it quite yet, but my hope absolutely is to finish the manuscript this year. That's so exciting. Well, whenever it comes out, I can't wait to get it and read it. So, you know, it sounds so interesting. Um, it's it's just been wonderful to hear all about your research and your work. And it's so fascinating. And thank you so much for sharing that. Now, we have one question um, that we, we like to ask our interviewees. And it's, it's just a bit of a silly question. Um, and it's just that if you could be a beer, what beer would you be? Um, can I ha have two answers? You can have two answers. <laughs> yeah. So I am a, definitely a fan of, um, my box. Um, and I really, I quite like kind of old traditional German styles, but the other, other beer was brewed by, um, three sheeps and in Sheboygan and Eris in Chicago, they brewed a beer called Ella. Um, based on my research a few years ago for um, the Chicago Bruseum's uh, Beer Culture Summit. And so mm -hmm. that was a delight. Like that was a huge professional accomplishment <laughs> to have that I had never imagined that a beer would be brewed based on, you know, research I had done in an archive. So it was, and they used cluster, um, it was an all cluster uh, beer. And so that, I guess that would be my other answer was the beer Ella. That is so cool. <laughs> that is a very good answer. That's a very good answer. And Jennifer, you're at you're at the Chicago Museum on the League of Historians. Correct. Yes, with me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, which and and you've participated in the Beer Culture Summit. Yeah, which is fabulous. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. really Liz does and everyone else um, does such an amazing job, and it's you know I love kind of the heterogeneity of it, um, just on, on so many levels. There's some always great things to learn and, you know, things I had no idea about before and, and then get to hear about there. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on. This was amazing. I learned so much. I can't wait for your book. <laughs> so Thank for you. those, those of you listening at home, you can follow Jennifer Jordan at, it's at Edible Memory. Yes. That's me on Twitter. And then yes. on, on Instagram, I am sociology of plants. And um, my Twitter is, is, you know, kind of grouchy and grouchy politics and then beer. And my Instagram is just uh, weaving my new passion and, um, and plants. <laughs> so it's, my Instagram is very pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> That's different amazing. sides of your personality. Mm, yes. different, yeah. 
Amazing. So thank you so much for coming on. Um, I'm sure everyone is just really appreciative of you just sharing your knowledge with us today. And um, thank you everyone for listening today. And remember to check us out on our socials or YouTube. And we really appreciate you. And if you like this episode so much, you can buy us a beer. So thank you so much to Jennifer for coming and we'll see you next time. Goodbye. Bye.